The following message is from Grace Life Church in Deltona, Florida. If you would like more information about Grace Life Church, or if you would like to hear more sermons from Grace Life, visit our website at www.gracelifeflorida.com. Amen. Go ahead and open your Bible back up to Psalm 63 again. Psalm 63 again. It was a little over a month ago that my wife and I celebrated the birth of our third son. His name is Jude. You'll meet him this morning at the end of the service. And he was born on Thanksgiving morning. And a bunch of my family was in town, you know, aunts and uncles and the whole deal. And it was a time of great celebration. Our families got to stop by the hospital to see the little guy the day he was born. And um, it was just great. We ordered a room service in the hospital. I mean, it was just glorious. It was totally glorious. I mean, you can picture the scene. It's Thanksgiving Day. I'm holding my newborn son, eating a turkey leg, watching NFL football. Okay? So it doesn't get much better than that uh, in this world. And so it was heaven on earth. And all was right with the world until that night. Because that night, Jude started breathing in really weird ways. I mean... He was almost like gurgling at times, and I told the nurse about it. She said, you know, that sounds normal, but we're going to hold him in the nursery overnight to uh, observe his oxygen levels, and we'll make sure everything's okay. And so they took him away Thanksgiving night and put him in the nursery all night, and the next morning, um, my wife and I awoke to some very sobering news, and it was Jude's oxygen levels were dropping. Um, they were becoming dangerously low, and also some blood tests that he had came back sort of scary. There were some elevated scores in there. And the doctors were concerned that Jude may have this really deadly um, bacteria that gets into baby's lungs. And so they wanted to transport him immediately to Orlando to the, the newborn intensive care unit. And so our, our little slice of heaven lasted about you know, 16 hours and it was shattered. And Lauren and I were reminded that we're living in a fallen world. A world where people, they suffer. Um, they die, where, where life is difficult, and then you die. That little slice of heaven was, was absolutely shattered, and we were quickly reminded that we are living in a fallen world, a world where Adam and Eve uh, defy God. You know, we'll, they, they wave their finger in God's face, and, and, and because of that, um, as a result of their sin, now everyone dies. Everyone suffers and everyone dies. And so we were quickly brought back to, to earth. And, and I know it's not a pleasant thing to think about the fall. I mean, we don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about the fall of mankind and suffering and evil. We try to keep that at arm's length. I mean, we do whatever we can to not think about the fall. I mean, we avoid hospitals and funerals and we turkey bacon, right? We take vitamins. We do all the things that we can do to keep the fall sort of like at arm's length, to keep it at bay and not think about it. And we even at times try to use moralism to protect us and to shield us from the fall. And so we tell ourselves things like, you know, bad people get bad things in life, good people get good things in life, and because I've served the Lord so devotedly, well then God certainly is going to bless me. But that's not true. I mean, tell that to the church planter in Indianapolis, I think it was, that he, he left for work one day, and his wife was brutally tortured and murdered. I mean, we're living in a fallen world and no one's immune from suffering. Moralism cannot shield us from suffering. Jesus was the holiest man that ever lived. He suffered the worst. So the fall hits everyone. Good people, bad people, Christians, non-Christians, religious people, non-religious people. And so all of us are going to suffer and all of us are going to die. And we're not all going to die of old age, you know, at John Knox Village. We're not going to spend our golden years watching Matlock and reruns of the People's Court, okay? Our last days on this earth. Some of us are going to have to call in hospice early because of the fall. And so the world is full of anguish and sorrow and nobody is immune from pain. No one. And because of that, when I received the news about my little son Jude, I was scared. You know, people think pastors never get worried or anxious or scared. I, I was scared. I was scared because I know my Bible, okay? And I know there's no verse in my Bible that specifically promises me that my son is going to live. There's no verse in this scripture that says all of your children are going to live a really, really long life and be happy and be healthy. I knew God was, was powerful enough to heal you. 
But I had no idea what God had in store for our family. And so I was scared because I knew my Bible. I was also scared because I know church history. And my favorite theologian from church history is a guy named John Owen. And John Owen had 11 children. Ten of them died in infancy. Only one of his children, a daughter, lived long enough to become an adult. She got married. Shortly after her marriage, she died of tuberculosis. And so one of the most gracious, gospel-centered, healthy, balanced guys who only slept four hours a night so he could write more books and do more ministry for the Lord, poured himself out, outlived his entire family and his wife. He died all alone. And so I'm scared, okay? When the doctor comes to me and says, Jude's not doing well, you know, I'm not walking around just comforting my family like, don't worry, we're going to believe God. You know, Jude's going to be fine. He's going to heal Jude. I have no idea. Why lie to them? Why lie to my family? Because this world is full of suffering and pain. I'm sorry, Joel Osteen, every day ain't a Friday, okay? Every day is like a Monday. And like the Monday after daylight savings time, okay, catches up. That's what life is like. And so I was scared. I was scared. I had no idea what the future held. But even though I was scared, and even though I didn't know what the future held, I did know this from the Bible. I knew that no matter what happened, God would be enough. That was a promise in the Bible that I could go to. And actually, that's the promise of Psalm 63. The promise of this psalm is that when all hell is breaking loose in your life, God will see you through and God will be enough. That's the promise of Psalm chapter 63. And so the very first thing I did after I got that news, I sat down in that hospital chair. That's disgusting. And I sat, I opened this Bible up and I started reading and praying through Psalm 63, asking God to give me the faith to believe it. Because this psalm, it's so stinking rad. It is. I mean, David is going through the ringer right now. And he has utmost joy and, and he's worshiping God. It's unbelievable. His life is in shambles. And it hasn't affected his joy at all. And, and allow me to give you the background just for a moment, because when we read Psalm 63, we're reminded of a Corona commercial. We are. It sounds like that. It sounds like David was sitting in a hammock on a white sand beach, you know, journaling lofty thoughts about God with nothing bad going on at all. But really, this was a very, very low point in David's life. This was a very emotional time in David's life. You see, King David... Had a son. He had a son named Absalom, and Absalom was a, he was a very ambitious young man. You can call him that. Uh, he was very rebellious, and Absalom um, despised his father and secretly wanted to become king in his father's place. And so what Absalom did is he would hang out on the courthouse steps all day long, every day, and he would bribe people and he would make political promises to people and he would say things like this. If I were king and not David, my father, I would give you everything that you're asking for. I would give you everything that you want. Absalom, he, he ran for, for king every day of the week. And, and 2 Samuel chapter 15 says that Absalom stole the hearts of the Israelites. Over time, more people became loyal to Absalom than to King David's dad. And David, completely oblivious to this, has no idea until one day an informant comes to David... And he says, listen, your son Absalom, everyone's with him now. And he wants to be king. And he's going to come kill you, basically. And David, in a split second, his life is turned upside down. And so he basically, he packs a suitcase and he leaves town immediately. He flees his palace and he flees out into the Judean wilderness. He flees from his son Absalom out of fear. And so David wrote this song, okay, not on a white sand beach somewhere. He wrote this song in the desert, in the wilderness. You know, when we think of a wilderness, we think of a forest, but the word wilderness, uh, it's the word midbar in Hebrew, and it literally means a desert. It's not like Disney Fort Wilderness with, you know, lots of trees and, you know, lakes full of bass and Space Mountain, okay? Don't think so much of the Akala National Forest. Think of a wilderness being the surface of Mars. There ain't nothing there. There may be water there. You're going to dig for it and find out. Some rover is sometime. Okay? There's nothing here. It's not a refreshing place. It's not like, cool, we're going camping. No, it's like we left the palace in our kingdom, and now we're on Mars. 
And if you see Total Recall, that's not good, okay? No one's seen Total Recall, okay? <laughs> the end is fabulous. Anyway, David fled all the comforts of his kingdom, of his palace, everything. His chef, leather couches, personal trainer, everything. He's now on the surface of Mars, so to speak. He's in a desert with nothing, and he writes this song. And so the fall has smacked David across the face with two by four. The fall has hit home for David in a big way. And everything that David holds dear has been pretty much stripped from him. His family, comforts, everything. And therefore, you would expect this psalm to be a psalm of despair. You'd expect it to be a psalm of lamentation where David's saying, you know what, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you take everything away? But you know what? That's not what David says. In fact, David is worshiping in the middle of nowhere. I mean, he says in verse 4, look there, he says, I'm going to bless you all the days of my life and raise my hands to you. Verse 5, I'm going to praise you with joyful lips. Verse 7, in the shadow of your wings, I'm going to sing for joy. I mean, this, this is counterintuitive type stuff. This guy is suffering horribly. His own son wants to murder him. And David is praising God in this way. And perhaps you're wondering to yourself, you know, how could that be? How did David get this next level type perspective? And how can I do the same? Well, David made two very important decisions when the fall came knocking on his door. Two very important decisions. First of all, David clung to God instead of idols. And secondly, David chose to look for satisfaction in God and not in his circumstances. Those are two cognizant decisions that David made when tragedy struck. And so first of all, David clung to God over against idols. And in verse 1, look at the way verse 1 starts. David, he confesses, he says, Oh God, you are my God. Now, time out, stop right there. Because a lot of you, when I read that, when you just heard that, you thought to yourself, Bible filler verse. You thought David's just getting warmed up here. And, you know, it's kind of like, this sounds like a throwaway verse to us. Oh God, you're my God. It's kind of like eating crab legs, you know, and you got the little tentacle, and you say, you know what, I'm going to skip the tentacle and go right to the claw because the claw has the meat. You know what, we think the first part of verse 1 is like a little tentacle, but I'm going to tell you something, it's really a claw. It's really a claw. It's not Bible filler. Because listen, that phrase, oh God, you're my God, that sets the tone for this whole song. I mean, it all starts here. Because right out of the gate, David says, God is the only God of my life, ain't nothing else my God. And you see, one of the things that suffering does is it reveals to us what we have been leaning upon to make life worth living. It exposes idols in our lives. And many of us, we think we're trusting in God, but really we're trusting in the blessings that God gives us. Many of us think we're tight with God, but in reality, we're just serving God to get, I don't know, health, wealth, prosperity. And David confesses right out of the gate, God, you are my God. Not that palace, nothing. Nothing that you've given to me is my God. And so this is huge because many of us are happy and content and we serve God and we're devoted to God as long as everything's going well. As long as everything's already going our way. And so as long as, you know, our job is stable and our kids are, are, are safe and they're healthy. And as long as, you know, we're getting plenty of likes on Facebook. And as long as our NFL team is winning, we're good. The Bible planning, uh, you know, Bible reading plan is up to date. You know, I'm here, I'm ministering. But listen, when God starts to take things away, all of a sudden we're confronted with what's really the God of our lives. And many times we don't respond well. We don't. Many times when God starts to take things away or when he withholds something we really, really want, we turn on him and become angry and bitter at God and our joy is zapped. And that's why when we go through times of intense suffering, very few of us can confess, oh God, you are my God. What we really say in our mind, never in church because we're holy in church, right? But this is what we say in our minds. God, I wish you would leave me alone. We don't want 
God to come near. We don't want to draw near to God. We want God to get away from us. And so we say in our minds, God, I just, I just wish God would leave me be. Now, we all have the Holy Book on, right? Because we are in church. But listen, the best Christians have these thoughts from time to time. The best of men and women do. I mean, the Bible says that Job was the godliest man on the face of the earth. And when Job suffered, when he went through the ringer, it says in Job chapter 7, Job cried out and he said, God, will you not leave me alone for one second so I can swallow my spit? That's an Old Testament way of saying, God, will you not give me a moment of just reprieve? Will you not separate yourself? In other words, God, I wish you would leave me alone for a little bit because you're making my life miserable. The best of Christians have that response at times. And the reason we react that way, the reason our joy is zapped, is because something other than God is really the God of our lives. And we're trusting in something other than God to buoy us up and to make life worth living. And the Bible, the Bible calls that idolatry. Idolatry. Whatever you're looking for um, to get you through the day, that's really your God. It is. It doesn't matter what we profess with our, with our mouth, theologically. Whatever you get out of bed for in the morning, um, whatever you think about all the time when you have nothing else to think about, whatever, if it were taken away from you, you would not be just sad. You would be devastated. That really is the God of your life. And so one of the reasons that God brings trials and suffering into our lives is to reveal to us who or what is really God of our lives. That's why he does it. Because you can't know what's driving you when everything's going well. You have no idea. We don't know how superficial and mercenary our love for God is, our trust in God is. You know, every Christian in this room has a gap, okay, between their confessional faith and their functional faith. Confessional faith, that's theological accuracy. That's Bible facts. That's Bible knowledge, okay? Confessional faith, though, has to do with devotion. Has to do with where your heart is, what your heart is worshiping and serving, okay? And so confessional faith can, can intellectually grasp God's love, but functional faith is when God's love experientially grasps you. And so listen, if you're smart, confessional faith will get you an undergrad degree in the Bible, okay? But confessional faith will get you through life. And there's a gap in all of us between confessional faith and between functional faith. And in the midst of suffering, we don't ask intellectual questions. We ask emotional questions. We do. We ask questions like this. Can I really trust this God? Does God really have my best interest at heart? Does God really have a plan? Is God really all loving? Well, nobody has a study Bible open during a time of trial and is just digging into the footnotes and saying, wow, I didn't know the Sea of Galilee was 140 feet deep. It's amazing. It's just getting me through my trial. Listen, we don't ask intellectual questions. We ask emotional ones. And our functional faith is revealed during the trial. And so we can all say, oh God, you're my God when things are going great. And it's all barbecues and ball games. But when the fall hits home, our functional faith is truly revealed. What we really believe is revealed and manifested. And David confesses in the midst of this terrible circumstance, he says, oh God, you're my God. You are my God. I don't want my kingdom back. I don't want my palace back. I don't want my family back. I want you. I seek you. I seek you, God. And sure, you're thinking, you're thinking to yourself, how did David get here, though? How, how, did, he, how did he gain that, that perspective? Where did this maturity come from? The answer is found in our second point. The reason David could say, oh God, you are my God in the midst of terrible heartache is because David looked for his satisfaction in God and God alone and not in his circumstances. David knew from past experience that God's presence, namely, specifically, it was God's love that would satisfy him. And because of that, he knew that God's presence was all he needed to make it through anything. Look at verses 2 and 3. Look at, look at verse 2 first. David says, So I have looked upon you. That's past tense. I have looked upon you in the past in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Verse 3. 
because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Stop right there. Underline, highlight, whatever you got to do in your iPad. Underline verse 3, because this is the theme of the entire song. The reason why David could confess, oh God, you're my God, is because David had experienced God's power and God's glory, and that's revealed specifically to fallen sinners through God's steadfast love, his loving kindness. In fact, go ahead and circle on top of that. Go ahead and circle the word steadfast love. Because th this word is electric. It's electric. It's the word in Hebrew, chesed. And whole entire books have been written about this Hebrew word. This word is it's very particular. This word, steadfast love, it's never referred to a man's love for another person. It's never referred to a man's love for God. It's only and ever used for God's love for his people, no matter what happens. It's God's steadfast love, his unfailing love. And that's why it's called steadfast love, because it's steadfast. It's standing firm and ain't going nowhere. It's love that will never pull the ejection handle. It's love that you can call at 3 a.m. in the morning from prison, and it's always there for you. That's the kind of love that God has for his people. And that's the kind of love that David experienced. And David had experienced God's steadfast love in an experiential way. And he knew it was better than anything down here. It was better than anything in this life. And so the reason that David could willingly surrender and let everything go is because David knew that he could never be separated from his greatest source of joy, which was the love of God. Not the power of God, but the love of God. It's God's steadfast love that draws our hearts to him because we're fallen sinners. And David held all his earthly belongings and blessings very loosely because he didn't delight in God's blessings so much as he delighted in God's love behind those blessings. You know, there was a period, his name was Jeremiah Burroughs, and he wrote a book. It's a really awesome book. It's called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And in that book, he had a nugget and a half. This is an awesome quote. He said, The godly man lives upon the dew of God's blessings. He doesn't live upon the blessings themselves. That's awesome right there. The godly man lives upon the dew of God's blessings. He don't live upon the blessings themselves. And think about this. This is what Jeremiah Burroughs is saying. He's saying, the godly man does not live upon God's gifts. He lives upon the, the, the love of God that's behind those gifts. It's God's heart that he lives upon. Let me give you a, a, an example from everyday life. My wife and I, Lauren, when we were dating and I lived in California and I was in seminary, she, she knit me a blanket one year for Christmas. And she had never done what she did before, so it took her a long time to knit this blanket, okay? Forever. And, and when she got done, to be honest, it was a little bit lopsided, okay? Just, just a wee bit. You know, if I remember correctly, I think it was like at night time, like my left leg and my right arm was exposed or something like that. So, anyway, but listen, it immediately became very, very precious to me. Immediately. It became my go-to blanket on those cold California nights. And listen, I had plenty of blankets already. Electric blankets, flannel blankets, and they were all warm and perfectly square. But listen, Lauren's blanket was awesome. It was dear to me. Why? Because of the love behind it. I knew how much time she spent on it. And so it was precious to me. And listen, we've gotten married since then, and, and I have no idea where that blanket is now. I have no idea. Could be in the attic. Could be in the closet. I, I can't tell you the last time I saw the blanket, but here's the thing. Even though I don't know where the gift is, that dew has never left me. The dew is still with me. The dew upon that gift. Because, listen, that blanket drew my heart to Lawrence in an even greater way. And so I don't go around my house demanding where the gift is. I've got Lauren right there. And that dew can never be taken away from me because of all the time and the love behind that gift. That's what Jeremiah Burroughs is getting at here. He's saying the, the godly man, he didn't live upon the gift. He lives upon the dew of the gift, the love of God behind the gift. You know, all of God's good gifts, they're just signposts pointing us to his heart. That's all they are. And you know, we're supposed to use the gift to worship the giver, but so often we use the giver to worship the gift. It's backwards. 
We're driving on the wrong side of the road. And the reason we fixate upon God's gifts and we refuse to give them up is because we haven't yet experientially tasted the goodness of the Lord. Our, our palates aren't deep. There's not much depth to them. We don't have a, an experiential knowledge of how good God's love and God's kindness and God's favor is towards us. We don't really understand grace. And so we get bitter and we get angry at God in seasons of suffering because we don't really see in a detailed way the beauty of the gospel. We don't. And so we need a greater grasp of his love. That's what we need. Martin Luther put it this way. He said, because God will take away all of our goods and our very life through many tribulations, it is impossible for the heart to be calm and to bear this unless it clings to better goods that is, it must be united with God through faith. I mean, Luther just lays it out. He's like, listen, every day ain't a Friday. This world's bad, you're going to suffer, and then you're going to die, and you're going to be part of everything that you hold dear. But here's the, here's the key, he says, cling to God. Cling to the love of God through Jesus Christ. That's our only hope for living in a fallen world. The only way that you and I are going to survive and be satisfied in a fallen world is by delighting in the love of Christ our Savior. That's the only way. That's the only way. And so the secret to being satisfied down here is by delighting in the love of God. And so my first point, it, it really hinges upon this second point. Because the only way that you can joyfully cling to God and spurn idols in your heart is if you delight experientially in God's love towards you. That's the only way. I mean, willpower is not going to get you. We heard that last week from PT. Willpower will not get you there. You know, self-determination will not get you there. Not even stoicism and hardening your heart against God's blessings will get you there because we don't need to love things in this world less. We need to love God more. It's not like you just shut your heart up and just not love anything in this world, not join anything and become a sourpuss, okay? You love God's gifts, but you love God more. And so you can't get there with self-denial or willpower or being stoic. There are many religious people in churches, and they talk all day long about sacrifice and self-discipline and taking up the cross, and bam, they want to hit you in the face and talk about how much they, they've given up. And they're like, yeah, I got saved about eight years ago and stopped having fun. How about you? When did you get saved? They've got this, this persona that becoming a Christian is this really, really distasteful experience. And there's so many other things we'd rather be doing right now than sitting in an auditorium listening to the Word of God. But listen, the reason that they talk that way is because they're trying to flee from their idols and they don't yet understand grace. They don't grasp experientially the goodness and the love of God and how much God loves them and how much God gave for them. And they don't really understand that, that God's, his hesed, his loving kindness is better than anything they've walked away from in this life. In fact, David says something amazing in verse 5. Look there. David says, this is a money verse, he says, communion with you, fellowship with you, satisfies my soul as with fat and rich food. My soul is filled up and satisfied, David says, with a rich and fatty meal. Now listen, that sounds kind of strange, but that's because the phrase fat and rich food, that refers to a part of the animal called the suet. Okay, the suet, I'm sure you know what that word is, I'm sure you're butcher. Okay, but the suet is the fatty portions around the vital organs of an animal. And here's the thing. The Jews were forbidden from eating the suet. They couldn't eat it because they weren't allowed to have fat. The fat was reserved for the Lord. Leviticus chapter 3 says this, All fat is the Lord's. This is a perpetual statute throughout all your generations and all your dwellings. You shall not eat any fat or any blood. So when a Jew ate an animal... The, the, the suet or the fatless, you know, the tastiest and the most delectable and succulent parts of the animal that were also most harmful for your health, they weren't allowed to eat those. They never tasted those. Those were reserved strictly for the Lord and they were to be offered up on the offering as a choice portion for the Lord. And this is what David is saying. He's saying communion with you, God, is like eating the suet. I'm tasting things through communion with you that I can't get anywhere else in this world. We re 
experience things, we get things through our diet with God, through communion with Him, that we're not going to experience anywhere else in this world. And because of that, David says, my soul is satisfied. I'm busting. Because my soul is, is feasting upon the most succulent and tasty meal through sweet communion with my God. So David, he's confessing, the only place that satisfaction is really found is in the love of Christ, in the love of God our Savior. And that's because human beings, we were made, we were made to live upon the loving kindness of God. We were created to experience and to marvel at, to sing about, and to shout about God's steadfast love. That's why we're here. That's the purpose of the entire universe. You know, we, we always ask ourselves, we ask ourselves questions like, why am I here? What's life all about? You know, what's the purpose behind this, you know, this big blue ball spinning in the middle of nowhere? People wonder, why am I here? What's life all about? It's about the gospel. That's why we're here. You know, in eternity past, God existed. And he was manifesting his glory and his power in atom splitting, you know, times a billion nuclear fusion, you know, type of ways. Just amazing displays of glory and power. And the angels, the seraphim who have front row seats in heaven, they were marveling at God's power. They were marveling at God's glory. In fact, Isaiah chapter 6 says the seraphim have to wear welding masks. They have to cover their eyes because they can't gaze upon the UV rays of God's holiness. So powerful. Isaiah chapter 6 says God created one class of angels with, with three pairs of wings. One pair is for flying. The other two pairs are for holiness. One pair to cover their eyes. One pair to cover their feet. Because God is so holy that some angels have never even seen him. That's how God dwelt in eternity past. And you know what God said to himself? He said, my glory, my power is on full display. But there's some attributes that I'm not able to manifest in this state because there's no need for them yet. And so I want to create an experience, an environment where my loving kindness, my steadfast love, my grace is on full display. I want to place my grace and my goodness at the center of existence. And so I'm going to create the universe and I'm going to create the world, and I'm going to create human beings, and I'm going to place them in a garden, and they're going to sin against me. They're going to rebel against me, and they're going to reject me. And because of that, they're going to place themselves justly in front of my wrath. And I'm not going to take pleasure in that, because that's not the end game. It's not my wrath being exercised. No, the end game is this. I'm going to send my son to come to this earth and to die for the rebels. They're not going to get themselves out of the jam. No, I'm going to come and I'm going to bear their punishment in their place. And it's all because I want my steadfast love to be on full display for human beings. That's why we're here. That's the entire reason that we are on this planet. It's to marvel and to shout about and to sing and to live upon the, the steadfast love of the Lord. It's all about grace. And when you realize that, when you realize that you're not just an animal that's here to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die and there's nothing more here, when you realize it's God's steadfast love, that's the purpose for your existence. It's a game changer. Because for the first time in your life, there's satisfaction. When you come and partake of God's grace, you're satisfied. And you know, the steadfast love of the Lord, it quenches the appetites that we have, that we, we've been longing to, to have quenched our entire lives. You know, I waited purposely until Christmas ended to preach this to you because you've had your goodies for a few weeks now and you know they're not satisfying. You know, how, how's that iPad mini, you know, scratching that eternal longing in your soul? It's not doing it for you. That hoverboard is not doing it for you, is it? You know, and I'm going to burn your house down, but it's not doing it for you. That vacation, that cruise you took, that 20 pounds of pepper bark that you ate, that didn't satisfy your soul. Did it? Didn't satisfy your soul. No, you're still longing for something more because only God's loving kindness can satisfy us. And listen, the reason those things do not satisfy us is because whenever you take the U haul of your life and you hitch it to anything smaller than God, it's going to flatten the tires in that mud. There's not enough horsepower to pull it because no created thing can bear our greatest hopes, our greatest fears, our greatest dreams. Nothing created, not a spouse, not a kingdom, not a palace, not a person, not a job, not a reputation, 
not with celebrity status, nothing created down here can bear your greatest hopes and your greatest aspirations. Nothing can. Only the loving kindness of God can do that. And that's why it's so foolish to put all your eggs in one basket and just live in this world. Not only because it won't satisfy you, but because of the fall of mankind, the best this world has to offer is now nothing more than a cancer-causing agent. Do you know that? Because of the fall, it's ridiculous to put all of your eggs in this world because not only will it not satisfy you at the end of the day, but also at the end of the day, it'll cause cancer. It's a carcinogenic thing. You know, you like going to the beach, you like the sun, better not get too much sun, right? Skin cancer. You like a glass of wine, you like to drink a beer every once in a while, better not drink too much, roast the liver. Like a good cigar from time to time, like a Big Mac, who mm-hmm. doesn't like a Big Mac? Cancer, cancer, cancer. The best this world has to offer is nothing more than a cancer causing agent. And the more you indulge in it, the quicker it kills you. And that's why it's so foolish to put all of our eggs in this world and in one basket. And so we spend our lives looking for satisfaction, looking for pleasure. And we start accumulating all of this stuff. We're like this huge black hole in outer space just sucking in belongings. And you know what life becomes? It becomes preparation for one huge garage sale one day. That's all life is. And some of you are like, you know, I kind of like the stuff I've accumulated over the years. Yeah, of course you do. Your kids don't like it, though. Your kids hate it. You think it's cool. I think it's tacky. And listen, they're going to cry over you, and they're going to eat potato salad, okay? And the next day, they're going to put an ad in the newspaper that says, this state sale. That's what's going to happen. And everything you have worked so hard for that you've looked for pleasure in and satisfaction is going to be sold and liquidated for pennies on the dollar. We're telling the real news morning. I'm sorry, you might get mad at your kids when you leave here, but that's what's going to happen. All of life without God is just preparation for one huge garage sale. That's all it is. But we spend our lives running after things because we have not yet tasted. And I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about many Christians. They have not experienced or tasted the loving kindness of God. And the reason that David could worship in the wilderness is because he had tasted that reality. And so he said, you can strip me of anything, my kingdom, my family, my possessions, and I'll be completely satisfied because the one thing that can never be taken away from me is the only thing that I need. That's the only thing that I need. And those that grasp this reality, the most mature saints among us that grasp this deep reality that God's steadfast love is better than life, they're, they're unflappable. You ever talk to an old wily saint in the Lord, an old sea dog that's been through it all? You cannot move that person. They're like Tom Brady in the playoffs, man. They're going to shred you no matter what receivers are on the field. They're unflappable. They're psychopathic. They go about their business and nothing unnerves them because they're so sunk deeply into the love of God that nothing rattles them. That's how David was. I mean, how are you going to rattle David? You take everything away from the guy, he's in the middle of nowhere worshiping God. I mean, how are you going to rattle a guy like Habakkuk? In Habakkuk 3, he says, listen, even if the fig tree is blossom and there's no fruit in the vines, you know, and basically, you know, fallout four type conditions, nuclear apocalypse takes place, I won't be happy. Apparently, no one got fallout four for Christmas. Okay? Except my brother in law, Luke, he got it as well. But listen, he's saying, even when everything else deserts me, I'm still going to have joy. Because he says, Habakkuk 3 18, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. The God that loved me and that gave his life for me. You can't rattle guys like David, guys like Habakkuk, because they're so satisfied with the love of God, you can't touch them. They're like made men in the mafia. You can't get out of them. You can't. You can't touch these dudes. And this is encouraging to us because that means our difficult circumstances don't have to change for us to be satisfied in this world. They don't. So after we think, you know, once I have our kids in the duggers, once I have a better job, once I have more money, once I get my car lowered with rims, whatever it is in your, in your neighborhood, okay? Whatever it is that I'm looking for to give me life and pleasure and satisfaction, we think that's when I'll be happy. Listen, nothing has to change about your circumstances to be absolutely satisfied right this moment. Because God stands there with his arms open. Isaiah 55 style says, come to me and stop spending money on things that aren't going to satisfy you. Come and eat for free what is good, and I will delight your soul with rich food, he says. <clears throat> Psalm 63 promises us that the only thing standing between us and satisfaction in this fallen, jacked-up world is a deeper walk with Christ. 
Now, the next question is this. How, how, how do you get there? How do you taste and see the Lord is good? How, how do you experience what David experienced? How do you get there? It begins by realizing that this psalm is not primarily about David at all. It's about a greater king. You know, so often we think the Bible is about us. The Bible is not about us. The Bible is about God. The Bible is about Jesus specifically. And listen, one of the early church fathers, Hilary Poitiers, he said this. He said, the Psalms were written to instruct us concerning the glory and the power of the coming and the incarnation and the passion and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Psalms are here. And up to this point, we've been reading Psalm 63 and looking at David's character and saying, how do I match up? How am I doing? Am I, am I as strong as David or am I weaker than David? This is not the point of Psalm 63. Psalm 63 was not written to reveal David's wonderful character to us. Psalm 63 was to point us to an even greater king. And this king, this king also had a son named Adam that rebelled against him. This king also, he left his kingdom and he went to the wilderness to suffer. And this king, though, he was not driven out of his kingdom. No, he willingly and voluntarily laid aside his kingdom to come to the wilderness of this world and to give his life for the rebels. To give his life for the conspirators. Those that took the fruit and ate so they could be God themselves. That's the king that the scripture really points to. And the difference between David and King Jesus is this. In David's darkest hour, when he was all alone in the wilderness suffering, God was there for him. But in Jesus' darkest hour, when he was suffering on the cross, the steadfast love of the Lord was not there for him. Because God, his Father, turned his faith, faith away, and Jesus became a sin offering in our place. And the only thing that satisfied Jesus from all eternity was the love and fellowship of the Father. That could see him through anything, and that was removed and taken away. It wasn't so much the nails and the crucifixion that killed Jesus. It was the removal of the love of his father. And this psalm reminds us we're not saved by our level of suffering in this life. We're not saved by how well we're satisfied in God when a trial comes. No, we're saved because of a greater king. One greater than David that came and gave his life for the rebels. He gave his life for us. And the deeper we grasp that, beloved, the deeper we grasp that it's not riding upon our shoulders, that we continually turn away from God to serve idols, and God repeatedly shows us steadfast love, love that's always there, love that never pulls the ejection handle, love that will never reject your collect call from prison in the middle of the night. That type of love is always extended to us because the love of God the Father for His Son was broken on the cross. That's where the steadfast love of the Lord comes from. I have nothing more. Let's, let's pray and ask God to give us a little taste of that this morning.